The final example we have in this war between um, predators and pests are going to be aphids. Aphids cover a multitude of sins. There are really small ones and then there are the larger ones which we see more commonly outside the green fly that we see on roses and the black fly that we see on beans. Here's an example of one of the smaller ones. This is a peach potato aphid um, at 400 magnifications. Commercially, these are attacked with predators, again, like the little wasps that we talked about earlier. Um, and they're really quite effective. However, the problem is when you get up to the larger ones, you need to take a slightly different approach. Again, here's the sort of um, peach potato virus moving about, and you'll be able to see at the bottom the little breathing tubes, which is the kind of things that get bunged up by soft soap if you're taking that approach to it. So here are the common green fly that you're probably most familiar with, which we tend to see on roses. These are much too big to be attacked by the kind of parasites that, parasites that we were talking about. So we need to use more native predators like, um, for example, ladybirds or lacewings. They're also sort of suitable for attacking the um, kind of black fly that you get on broad beans, which we'll look at next. So these are the black fly that you'll see on broad beans. As you can see, there are um, quite a lot of them there and they're quite virulent because they have quite strong mouth parts and they attack the tender growing parts of the plants, you know, the shoots that you get both in the broad beans, traditionally you pinch the tips out to control them and also you get that on roses because this is where the plant cell wall is soft before it hardens off where it's still elongating. So it gives the pests an opportunity to get in. If you let them get hold, they will completely destroy the crop. So some action needs to be taken. Now you can of course do quite a lot with um, soapy insecticides like soft soap, which, or, or even washing up liquid, which as we've said before, tends to bung up their spiracles, their breathing holes. However, you can do a lot with using ladybirds, both either as their larval form or as their adult form, um, to control the aphids. They'll eat an awful lot of them. And they're actually really quite effective if you get it early enough, particularly if you're operating inside a sort of glass environment. Obviously, if you use them in the garden, there's a danger that they might um, fly away. But on the other hand, you are releasing more sort of natural native predators back into the environment, which is obviously a good thing. The middle panel here shows nature in action. There's a sort of rather resigned looking aphid being munched by a fairly vigorous looking ladybird. Another natural predator that we can use, which is, again is a native species, are these beautiful lace wings. The insects can be effective either as the adult form on the right or as the larval form. You can see a larvae having a snack of a black fly. Again, these are more expensive than the sort of cheap remedies of using sort of washing up liquid or soft soap, but um, they do have the advantage of rebuilding the sort of natural balance between predators and, um, and prey, which is a beneficial thing for the sort of environment generally. So here's the conclusion. Biological control uses natural predators and parasites to control the population of a plant pest. We've shown five examples here from our own experience of running our um, glass houses, but there are literally hundreds of different examples from all over the field. It's not cheap and it needs to be introduced into just the right environment and in the right quantity. It's not a magic bullet, but it's surely one of the most intelligent ways of controlling garden pests. Notice that I use the word control all the time. The ph philosophy of the organic movement is that agriculture and horticulture should work towards a balance with nature and accept within the ecosystem that always be some creatures which fill different niches. The challenge is to make sure things don't get out of hand. One of the things I think that's worth knowing is that, of course, this isn't only applied in the organic world. If you look at the large glass houses in the south of England, which provide tomatoes, herbs and um, peppers for the sort of supermarkets, they all use these kind of organic controls because they prefer not to use pesticides because they they're expensive and B, the supermarkets don't like them. So 
in effect, they actually do build an ecosystem. They quite often use a technique called pest in first, so that if effectively even a commercial grower of peppers will infest um, their deliberately their crop with a few red spider mites and then put the predators in to control it so that there is a balance throughout it. And this whole business of striving for balance is the backbone of the organic movement. Details of all the pests, predators and other remedies that we've talked about can be found on our website ladybirdplantcare.co.uk which um, you know we've been running for about seven or eight years and effectively most of the things that we sell through it are actually things that we use in our own glass houses and uh, obviously if you want to check out what we do and uh, look at the veg you can see it from our websites fletchingglasshouses.co.uk and plants of presence so i hope you found this um review of the some some common examples of practice of using biological controls to control pests useful and um you know we hope to hear from you in, in eventually if you've got uh, if you'd like to have a chat with us Bye-bye for now.